Welcome to the Divorce Matters Podcast, where we teach you how to survive the family court system. We will give you no-nonsense, straightforward strategies for getting you an equitable outcome. We guarantee you won't hear this advice anywhere else. A reminder that we are not attorneys and this is not legal advice. However, we will help you more than any attorney ever will. And now, here's your hosts, Michael Alexander and Mark Fidelman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Divorce Matters. We have a returning guest, Angel Law. That's a pseudonym because she's so mixed up in so many cases. Uh, but she's here to explain something that I have a lot of interest in, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you will, and that is how to properly complain uh, and get your judges or attorneys in trouble for violating your rights or the law or the million other things that they do. So with that, uh, Angel, let's talk about what it is that you've done and what you figured out and what a lot of people don't know. Just an overview. Great. So what um, has recently happened was um, I was a, a unique case where I was able to remove a judge from my own matter by filing a motion to disqualify the judge based upon the judge's very terrible conduct. Um, This is the most difficult way to remove a judge, and um, it's fraught with obstacles, and it's it's something you wouldn't want to do. But in the course of figuring that out, prior to asking the judge to remove himself because of his misconduct, I had first started off with making a complaint to the presiding judge of my courthouse. And this is really important because you uh, can usually obtain a form by contacting um, the clerk of your court. And there's an official form that you can even fill out in handwriting. It's about two pages long. It's an official complaint to the presiding judge, and you send it in. The presiding judge has 30 days to respond, and they must respond within those 30 days. Um, Now, this is something I also think could be a wonderful tool for all of us if we flood the courts. Um, and we drive the presiding uh, judges into having to answer for the uh, abhorrent misconduct of their subordinate uh, judges, we could maybe let them know, hey, we know that you guys aren't supposed to be doing this. And Mr. Presiding or Mrs. Presiding Judge, um, you know, you have an administrative and supervisory duty to do something about this. And maybe at least if, you know, just because they're, they don't want to do the work, they might say to their subordinate judges, hey, knock this off. I've got too many complaints to respond to. So step number one, um, when you've got a, an, an awful judge, um, is preparing to remove them uh, with either a 170.1 uh, or a coordinated effort where you're going to complain to the presiding and then you're going to complain to the CJP. Yeah, you, you thought, though, just interject that doing it this way to remove a judge is, is a lot harder than just going to 171, 170.1, 170.3, or even 170.6 if you haven't recused anyone yet, right? Yes. And um, in my experience, when I read the California Code of Civil Procedure, and this is not legal advice, this is my personal experience, I had a conversation with an appellate attorney, and a 170.6 is a preemptory challenge. That means within 10 days, of being appointed a new judge, like your case is um, assigned to a new judicial officer, you're supposed to have 10 days and you must complete your motion to challenge that judge and have them offer your case. Basically, you don't need to give any reason. Here's the well, Unless, you can, unless no they've reason. made a ruling, though. If they've made a ruling, then you can't do it, even within 10 days. Unless you get yourself a new attorney. Ah, and yeah. according to the code, According to the code, um, there's lots of patterns in practice of ignoring the law, but according to the code, if you have a new attorney, because it's or, it's dis, you know, I read it as disjunctive, and according to Black's dictionary, um, uh, or is two, two separate parties and is joins the parties. So um, if the litigant or the attorney um, like a new attorney, imagine if you have a new litigant that comes onto the case, of course they would get a 170.6. Or if you get a new attorney, that new attorney could file 
a preemptory challenge and pop your miserable judge off your case. So um, the 170.6, had I known um, the, 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 the incredible efforts that go into a 170.1, I would have started off getting a new attorney and then exercising a 170.6. I would have done it that way. But in any case, I, I proceeded with the 170.1. And I also say simultaneously or concurrently, because when I do things, I light about 50 wildfires at once yeah. until I, yeah. I encircle my enemy and there's just no way through the fire. So, um, you know, I'm going to get them coming or going. So what I then did was I layered a complaint to the presiding judge, and then I layered a complaint to the CJP, which is the California's Commission on Judicial Performance. Now, that, that's a website. You can, you know, everything here, you can Google search it. You know, you Google yeah. search uh, Commission on Judicial Performance. Their website is highly instructive. It's extremely easy to use. Now, what I learned um, after my judicial complaint was accepted was that it is discretionary for the CJP to have it, to enforce disciplinary action over a judge, but it is mandatory for the CJP to enact or to discipline a presiding judge. And so it's sort of this hierarchy, this tier system. And the CJP's real job uh, is to deal with the presiding judges not doing their job. And that's, what, that's how you can make this work. So you start the clock with you know, your two-page simple complaint to your presiding judge. And you don't complain about orders. The orders, the remedy is appeal. That's what these monsters say. Um, And so what what I did was I complained about their their conduct. You start with, you you know, you print off exemplar complaints from the Commission on Judicial Performance's website, complaints that went through, and then you can read the attorney general suing or, or the CJP's lawsuit to then take a judge out of office. And I'm sure you're because there's there's uh, there's only like one percent of good judges, and then the other ninety nine percent of the judges are going to have similar misconduct um, to other judges who have been removed from the bench. So just look at those cases and then cut and paste because I'm yes. sure your judge is treating you as bad, if not worse, than the people who um, had these judges removed from office. So just go through like with a highlighter and just copy how the CJP said like this judge did this this many times and is in violation of this judicial canon when they did this. Use that. Don't discuss your orders. And whatever you do, don't try to say an order is the conduct. You you can't make, it has to be a direct, you know, he punched me in the nose and I had a bruise on my nose. That's, it has to be a direct connection. So just go through exemplar complaints that have, that have won copycat them for yours, send those first to the presiding. Um, The presiding will write you their um, mandatory cover-up letter and say that there's nothing to see here and you're, you're clearly, you're the problem and their judges are wonderful. And, you know, you pain in the ass litigant. I can say that then after you've gotten that response within the first 30 days, and it's not sufficient to correct your grievance, then you complain to the CJP about the presiding failure to take corrective action because what the presiding is supposed to do is do something. Uh, oh, well, I'll look into this. I'll do this. We've done corrective action. Nope, they're going to do nothing. And so then you tell the CJP, hey, the presiding judge uh, you know, did nothing with my complaint. And I, I made these you know, um, clear complaints to the matters that they should have taken care of. Then the CJP says, oh, yeah, that does look legitimate. Okay, we'll have a look at it. Then your CJP complaint, you know, you put in the judge's name and you can put in multiple judges. And that's how you put in your presiding and the subordinate judicial officer or officers that you've complained about. And then you add your information, your attorney's information, if you have one. And then in addition to that, there'll be a place to upload documents. And it's just like 
uploading to any other system uh, is very easy. You can upload 10 documents up to 10 megabytes each. If you don't know how to use Adobe Acrobat and compress files, learn. And, um, and then here's the neat news. If you get beyond 10 exhibits, you can re-input the same uh, you know, judge and your personal contact information on a fresh page and add more documents. Um, I've probably added uh, approximately 100 exhibits to my CJP complaint. So there's um, no shortness there. Now, keep in mind, these people are just doing a job and they don't care about your case as much as you do. So something else that I did was I uploaded PDFs of my transcripts that are clean and just the you know certified copies. And then separately, um, I used PDF editor and I would highlight and add annotations in colorful writing, pointing out what the judge was doing that was... Um, you know, such uh, egregious misconduct, make it kind of like, you know, I, and, and I was, I'll say I was entertaining and um, colorful with my language, not vulgar, but colorful, and just show them the absurdity and the ridiculousness of what you're enduring, because you know, there are, there are valid courtrooms. And the other, one of the mainstays of your complaint has to be like, look how this court is stripping the judicial system of our faith and trust and in the dignity of the justice system, these judges are causing um, terrible reputational harm to the California judicial system. And that will get their um, attention. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I wasn't blaming people or, you know, things like that. I was like, they're doing these things wrong, you know, just kind of very mathematical. They violate it on this day, on this page, at this line number. It appears to me that Canon, you know, blank was violated went because the judge did this. Now, you're not even required to go to that extent. But if you go and flag and do somebody's homework for them, in my experience has been you get a much better result. Does it work for attorneys as well, or is it just judges that this process works yeah. for? So the, the CJP is exclusively for the judges. Yeah, okay. So it, it, it begins and ends there. And Is that, um, is that for yeah. not just judges, but commissioners? Yes, but commissioners are a multi-step process as well. It's actually the commissioner process is that you first report them to their supervising or overseeing judge. And then you're supposed to report them to the presiding. So um, in a way, people, I think, who complain about their commissioners have inadvertently done the procedure correctly where they complain to the presiding, presiding as expected, fails to do anything. And then they went to the CJP and that's why their complaints worked. The, um, I, when I began um, my complaint process, I did not realize that I had to complain to the presiding first. I just did it because um, I did. It was just, you know, fool's luck. And um, and so anyways, I made a complaint to the presiding and then I went back and forth. The presiding couldn't be so bothered with me. So he sent it to his supervising judge, um, whose name is Julie Palafox. And she and I went back and forth. Um, I wrote her no less then 50 pages, single space uh, complaints and very strong worded accusations about um, her acts of conspiracy, collusion, fraud, aiding and abetting. You could state anything you want. How do you prove some of the allegations? I know you, you get the transcripts. Unfortunately, people are, hopefully people are getting transcripts of every, every uh, hearing, but are you Ooh, tying it always to the good transcripts? News. Yeah, uh, I do. I, I do that. Plus, I show their minute orders. And then um, because I am extra feisty, um, I went around and checked the judge's calendar. And I also help on a tremendous number of cases. So I collected all of the relevant transcripts and minute orders for similarly situated persons. And then I added their cases to my complaint to show a pattern in practice so that if this judge dare attempt to assert the fantasy that this was an isolated event, um, he would just look absolutely ridiculous. And I really hope 
that he did that. I hope that he got it. And they said, hey, this chick, Chris Black, is complaining about you. And um, and then he said, oh, yeah, I never did that before. And they said, well, that's funny because she submitted eight other cases and their transcripts and all the work she did on her case. She did it for their eight cases. And it's looking pretty oh, bad for you. you. Ready to tell the truth yet? Well, that's a lot of cases that you had to go pull transcripts for. How were you able to do that? You just contact one of the litigants? Well, they contact me. Oh, well, that's true. But the average person, that's, it's not going to be in your situation. The average person, the average person, pull the judge's calendar, pull up the people's case number, go to the public court, print off their, you know, some relevant documents, get their, case, get their telephone numbers off of the public records, and call them. I'm sure you'll be friends very quickly. You can see yeah. what's going on from the um, right. minute orders and such. So it's really easy to do. Really, really easy. Like finding okay. people on Facebook, you know. So, um, so then you'll um, you'll get a, a, a response from the CJP rather quickly, and um, from there they might ask you to produce some more information. Um, you're not supposed to share the contents of uh, your complaints or what's going on, and that's pursuant to the California Constitution. Apparently, you know they like. I guess secrecy is super helpful for um, badly behaving judges that they uh, ratified, you know, it as some sort of uh, either amendment or something to the California Constitution to, to keep the misconduct of their judges secret. Now, I, this is very important news and, and somewhat sad. Here is what should devastate you. The CJP, their hands um, are in, in very many respects bound um, by they're not supposed to get involved in a judicial complaint where the matter's currently before the judge because the, uh, the evil judges have bound together and said, oh, ho, ho, CJP, if you got involved every time somebody complained about us, it would interfere with the jurisprudence, yeah. and which was a nice way of them protecting themselves, right? right? And so that is why you need to remove your judge um, because then the CJP can act. Um, and that's what I even, you know, I said it to the CJP. I'm like, so you mean I should lose all my rights, come out with terrible orders, uh, burden the court of appeals because you guys wouldn't st step in when he's, you know, clearly, uh, he, you know, the, the, the misconduct is so flagrant and so out of control. And there's so many of us and you guys are going to let this go on. And um, I was so offended that, you know, I just kept working really hard at it. So um, that's another big thing. If you're like, oh my gosh, like, you know, and whatever you do, please don't listen to people that say, oh my gosh, CJP complaints never work. And then you're like, oh yeah? Tell me how many of them have you filed? Mm -hmm. Crickets, crickets, crickets. And they'll hesitate when they say, well, there's no point because the answer is zero. So, um, you know, don't ever take advice from somebody who's not done something before. It's a bad idea. Um, yeah. But so anyways, the point being that now here's another idea, folks. The CJP can't take action on a case for a litigant if you're in front of them, right? Well, you can have witnesses filing CJP complaints, and it most certainly would not be an interference of the jurisprudence between the litigant uh -huh. and the judge because an That's independent good. observer was seeing it. So the conflict is between a concerned citizen and the judge. Yeah. Um, so, so what do you do? You just have somebody that's been watching the, the case or reviewing the transcripts make the complaint instead? That person absolutely should make a complaint. As many independent observers or persons who have read the transcripts and do not believe that person could or is receiving a fair trial or that, that the uh, judge appears to be embroiled or impartial, and it's the appearance, we don't have to prove it, just the appearance of bias, impartiality, embroilment, or that you as a witness have lost faith in the judicial system because of the unjudicial, canon-violating acts of a certain judge. You're no longer in it alone. You finally have a way, it's almost like a jury, um, that you can get people to tell the CJP, hey, you guys need to do something about it, you know, under your watch. The, the, you know, and you can also complain to the um, presiding. A witness can pr complain to the presiding, and that definitely happened in my case. And, um, you know, most attorneys are like weak need, and so they won't file these for you. 
but they're actually uh, they're they're actually supposed to. But we all know attorneys are not to be trusted, and you know, code of ethics means nothing to them. So whatever. Yeah, for sure. That bad audience for you know, right. ethics. Um, but the, uh, attorneys have a duty to report uh, misbehaving judges. Misbehaving judges have a duty to report each other. So here's another one. When you have um, a presiding judge not reporting his misbehaving subordinate judge, you can point out that judge is violating um, his or her judicial canon by not reporting their subordinate judicial officer. Another really um, high likelihood that, you know, of misconduct that I find that sticks quickly is also if you've had matters fully submitted, meaning fully briefed, everything submitted, and then the judge um, delays a decision, you have a judge only has 90 days to rule. And I have a whole like chart on that stuff. But when a judge has not ruled within the 90 day period, it, there's a case called McCullough, McCullough v. Commission on Judicial Performance, um, where the the, the the judges have to sign a financial affidavit every 90 days uh, in order to receive their pay statement. They must sign an affidavit saying that there's no matter fully submitted in excess of 90 days that they've not ruled on. And they lie like dogs. Yep. So um, then what you do is you say, hey, CJP, don't take my word for it go check out the financial affidavits because this matter has been submitted for X number of hundred days and has never received a decision. And it would appear to me, now granted, I haven't seen those records, uh, CJP, but it would appear to me that someone and the presiding must be falsifying financial affidavits. And oh, by the way, a presiding judge is required to report a judge who has, it's, it's called like, either if they're not, if they're late, to court, they're not, you know, showing up um, when, you know, 8.30 a.m. They're supposed to report their judge for doing that. They're supposed to report their uh, subordinate judge for not ruling on matters in a timely fashion. And then your presiding is also in trouble. Uh, so you can get them both in trouble just off of, uh, and that's, that's also forgery and fraud. Um, yeah. Perjury. It's perjury. It's, it's acts of perjury because they perjured their, themselves to get their paycheck. Okay, so how do you, but how do you prove that? Oh, you just tell them to go check it out because there's something called a 90 day aging report. And so like, let's say you, but you have to have an issue or you have to know of issues that have been submitted to uh, a court and then not ruled upon. And which is like, really like, that's like shooting fish in a barrel. I mean, like in my own matter, I have matters that have been fully submitted since 2017. You haven't even had a divorce hearing or a final divorce hearing in eight years, right? Isn't that true? Uh, well, um, I'll, I, I bifurcated my divorce in 2015. Yep. I stipulated and gave my ex a bunch of things, and I took on the community. That whatever, I, had a, I had a global marital settlement agreement, and that was in 2016. And it has never been entered into a judgment because of the judge. They won't enter my MSA, my marital settlement agreement. And then I had a subsequent stipulation to clarify the 2016 in 2019. And so I had a second stipulation in 2019. Then in 2020, I had my second stipulation that was not being cooperated with entered as a judgment pursuant to 664.6, which is when you make an out-of-court agreement if one person, like, you know, let's say that you, you two even write up on a piece of paper, um, hey, you know, you get this house, I get this house, you get this car, I get this car, and that's how we're going to write up our assets. Sign here, date it, blah. Um, and it's just on, like, you know, somebody's construction paper, even written in crayon, not a problem. You can bring it into the court and ask that it be entered pursuant to a motion to enter an out-of-court agreement, oral or written, if you have like really good records on it being, you know, verbal, uh, uh, into judgment. So in 2020, um, I spent, you know, another few thousand pages of my uh, court records doing that. And (laughs) 
they didn't enter it into a judgment, even though I submitted five different versions for them to enter into a judgment. And then while waiting for the cooperation of the court to enter their own order into an FL-180 judgment form, uh, my ex-husband changed his identity for the third time. And so all of the documents I had wouldn't cover his newest identity. So it wouldn't be very useful. Okay. So uh, we're getting a little bit off track. All that's yeah, very, sorry. That's, very But useful. just to show you, just to yeah. show you guys, like how that's how a bad judge can like just destroy the court system. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and uh, I think we've covered your case. Yeah. Um, yeah. But just so people case. know, right. I've, I've gone nine years and uh, over a hundred hearings and I've never had a trial. Right. It's insane. And, and, and real quickly, how have they been, have you figured out now that you have, you have such perspective, how do they, how do they, were they able to postpone it for that long? Oh, well, it's, it's, I mean, it, it violates. Yeah, but how, how do they do it? How do they do it? I mean, County of Orange Court was charged with racketeering in 2016. So yeah, it's a run by it, a bunch of criminals. What, was it the attorneys that were delaying it and, and you were just, you didn't know any better, so you didn't know how to challenge it? What, what was it that my, happened? My, my best case guess is um, that they cooked up backroom deals and they had sold off the decision of my case and I would not comply. And I, I had very good people helping me. So at sometimes I had seven attorneys plus me and we'd go to paper war and they were like, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> So I just would keep fighting. I would be like, no, like, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to apply the law. Okay, you don't want to do that? I'm going to go up to the Court of Appeals. Okay, you don't want to do that? I'm going to make a judicial complaint. Okay, you don't want to do that? I'm going to uh, disqualify the judge. Okay, you don't want to do that? And I just, I'm a street fighter. Yeah, that's good. We need more of you. Okay, is there anything related to complaining about judges, disqualifying judges? We did a whole disqualify the judge mm -hmm. episode a few back, so we don't need to cover that as much. But Anything in regards to complaining about judges that uh, someone should know that that wouldn't know looking from the outside in? Yeah, I think that, you know, what I just told you um, in terms of start with the presiding, but, you know, use the CJP website as your guide, then go back to the CJP. And, and they will send you a letter within like two weeks of your initial complaint. And now something else that's really big news, this is, this is huge for all of you, is the CJP got in so much trouble that they replaced the majority of their staff in April of 2022. Was that it from the auditor's report? You are correct. And now they, have, came out. Um, now they have meetings to follow up, sort of like an implementation on how to make things better. And at the end of the day, guys, here's why. Um, they were going to have their budget revoked. So they're going to have all their budget pulled because they're like, well, you guys are just doing nothing with all this money. So we're just going to fire all of you because there's no point in having you guys because you don't do anything. And then they're like, no, 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 watch, like, watch, like, we're going to, we're going to do some stuff. We're going to like get some judges in trouble. Watch me. And then you, if you look at the CJP's website, you'll see that they, every six to eight weeks, they're publicly admonishing another judge. And, oh, and, I, and, you know, I'll do this 50,000 foot overview. Um, the judicial complaint process takes about 90 days. You know, don't expect it to be overnight. Uh, you make your complaint. And then depending on what time of like a quarterly cycle you are in, your complaint comes in, an initial person reviews it to see if there's merit, if it's done in the right format, because most people complain about their orders and they'll, they just throw those complaints out because they're not to the proper format. They're just complaints. It's, it, this is about things that they regulate judicial canons and misconduct. So then if you have a meritorious complaint, they send it up for a committee of 12 people to review and then decide if they're going to do an investigation. Once the 12 party, it's like a quorum meet, they meet only every six to eight weeks. And also the holidays kind of switch things up. And then they decide if they're going to investigate. That when they investigate, they do not tell you. And by the way, I didn't make this up. 
um, an attorney from the CJP taught me all of this. Mm. So then what happened, um, and so they called me, the CJ, you know, they, they called me um, and talked to me. So then what happens is they uh, proceed with an investigation and they do that by, all right, I don't have my judge on my case. So they do that by interviewing the clerks, um, interviewing the, you know, court reporters, other people that work with them. Of course, their cover up clown bosses who need to save and keep in mind, right? They need to save that judge to save their own hiney. So it's great if you can complain about the presiding at the same time, because they're not credible because you've already shown the CJP how derelict of duty this supervising administrative role judge was. So that's, that's kind of how to make it, uh, you know, work. And then the, you know, the, the options are they, um, I mean, it's kind of funny, like but one of the things that they typically do is that they, um, the most common punishment is they, they say, okay, you know, um, you, you misbehave. Now you need to be under the supervision of another judge. Now, the reason that's great is a lot of judges are just egomaniacs. So, you know, all the other judges are snickering in the courtroom, like, <laughs> did you hear? And like, now they need to be under supervision <laughs> and it's not them. So they're, you know, terrible to each other, not just us. And, um, or they publicly admonish them and the judges, if you read how the judges fight back, like you cannot believe how, how horrible of human beings they are in that they, they protest being caught and they protest being contrite and they will like fight the CJP to the death that they shouldn't be removed from office. It'll turn your stomach. Um, because like these people are horrible. It's kind of like when you have a nasty, um, you know, uh, adverse party where they they believe that they are justified in what they're doing to you, and they'll take you down. They'll take everyone down because th- they're such an abusive person that they want to just hurt everyone, just not themselves. Yeah, um, so yeah I think that's I think that's about you know um, the, the the best. Uh, advice I can give. I would love to, um, you know, Mark, if it's, if it's, I, I got to make sure that it's legitimate, you know, that I can do it, but, um, or maybe I can, you know, do an online um, where I'll go through it step by step and I'll yep. read somebody else's case. Hey, Mark, do, or do you want it? Or who should we do this for? We should pick somebody and then I will be the witness and I will go into the CJP platform. I will maybe start, actually, we'll do it procedurally. We'll start with, I'll write um, a really uh, scathing, appropriately scathing complaint to a presiding judge about a case that, you know, like I reviewed in the witnessing of the transcripts, or I'll even go to some hearings. I have somebody uh, we can do it for, so let, let's connect after this. Okay. But I want to wrap this up. I really appreciate yep. you being on. My pleasure. Uh, we're talking about you becoming... Uh, a regular guest, if not a, a co-host here pretty soon. So, um, yeah. And and then one thing I do want to throw in there is guys, um, uh, bar complaints. Um, it's really, really hard for, uh, an opposing count, you know, an opposing party litigant to ever get them to stick against your own attorney. This, um, the, uh, state bar seemingly acts, keep in mind the state bar also just got in trouble. So that's like, that's like the pit of vipers. Like they're the most disgusting human beings on planet earth it, they all are at the state bar so um that's cover up central that's like yeah that's like where they hide where they throw away the baby bodies um so what i would say about that is they just got in so much trouble that they weren't allowed to collect the annual like 495 dollar bar fee uh, this year uh so they got to pretend like they're not the scum of the earth which they are so they're going to put a lot of effort into this so they're going to start like doing more, or at least going through the uh, uh, appearances of, of uh, disciplining attorneys. But if you complain about your own attorney, you have a really good chance of planning, complaining about adverse party, you have very low chance. Uh, your attorney, if you have one, if an attorney complains about another attorney, they pay attention to that. Um, and then the other one is, you know, you have, a, there's what's called candor to the court. Um, I like to look at business and professions code 6068, but then the state bar, I think it's section like 1.1 or 1.3 and you can, and like a California state bar candor to the court and you can look it up because they just came out with very stringent regulations on the duty to only give 
true and accurate presentations of the law or the facts, and otherwise they're violating candor to the court. If you catch your attorney or opposing counsel, uh, you know, so grossly manipulating facts, the record, whatever, you can point it out to the judge and then ask that the judge, pursuant to their own canons, report the offend because it's a shall that they are required to that the judge report the offending attorney to the state bar for violating candor to the court. You can, I mean, if you're already spitting venom at the judge, it's not such a bad idea because it's putting, it's putting together this record of, you know, you're in lawless land and you can even submit that to the state bar saying, look, I went to the judge asking that they make the referral. I don't know if they did, but here's where I pointed out the candor to the court. And then they're like, oh yeah, they actually did what they're supposed to. They, you have a better chance at the state bar. I, you know, I, I don't have good, uh, I don't have a good history with the state bar in terms of me seeing them doing anything. Um, the best cases are typically when they're violating, um, you know, the trust account, raiding the trust account, um, incorrect billing, things like that, you have a good chance on. But just the general misconduct of an opposing counsel, I'll, I'll say this, um, you know, just to give you a, like a level of misconduct. My opposing counsel, um, there's like lots of like actually fraud tampering with evidence, uh, like photoshopping documents. I mean, uh, where I've you know been able to prove it, but worse than that was uh, opposing counsel went to my attorney's office, uh, forced his way into the office, throwing the paralegal, who's a tough cookie, backwards into a wall, injuring her shoulder, her not knowing who he was, simply called the police, locked the door, but she was injured, um, wrote an affidavit, filed it to the court, and um, that not only did the judge do nothing, but uh, <laughs> if you want to laugh, maybe I'll post the letter, that the, <laughs> that the state bar said that there was no action, there was no act by the attorney that warranted um, disciplinary action. Yeah, well, of course. Did you expect anything different? No, and then, and then the police, the Garden Grove Police Department um, said at the time she didn't know who the attacker was and that they're not coming back out, even though <laughs> we figured out who the attacker was. <laughs>